social policy, what's needed in immigration reform a special event. My name is Kathy Eden and I'm here uh, as chair of the program and also to introduce our moderator, Edward, Edward Schumacher Matos, who has just joined us at the Kennedy School, which we're, we're thrilled about. Um, Edward currently directs the Harvard Interfaculty Initiative on Immigration and in Integration. He has 30 years of newspaper experience beginning right here in our own Quincy, Mass. Moving on to the Philadelphia Inquirer uh, and was part of a team in 1979 that won a Pulitzer and then on to the New York Times. He left this post in 2003 but continues an active interest in newspapering. He now uh, writes a weekly op-ed column for the Washington Post on immigration issues. Uh, Edward uh, received a BA uh, in literature and politics from Vanderbilt University and an MA from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy here at Tufts. He's been a Fulbright Fellow in Japan, a Binational Commission Fellow um, in Spain, uh, also served in the U.S. Army in Vietnam and was awarded a Bronze Star for his service. So I give you Edward Schumacher Matos. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> we have a great program here today, and I thought what I might uh, start off as sort of set the political stage uh, and lead into our panelists. Uh, immigration reform is not dead, but it's almost there. Um, um, we have two things sort of going on, two great general political trends, I'd say. One is a battle inside the Republican Party for its soul. Um, on the one hand, you've got what's going on inside the, the House, which has been, you know, essentially taken over by conservative Republicans who are populist Republicans um, and who, in, in the, was always been the divided Republican Party between its business wing, which has always been very pro-immigration, and the sort of a populist wing that, that um, is identified with the Tea Party, and now is more or less taking control of the party, particularly in the House, and is anti-immigration. Now, I'm just saying anti-immigration in general. Uh, it, it, you can say that it's anti-unauthorized um, immigration. Um, it's not against all immigration at all or all immigrants. Um, uh, but there is a nativist trend that mixes in there with views about uh, America uh, for Americans and very controlled or restricted immigration. And, and you know, th th this gets to be very complicated, and I don't want to... Um, uh, you know, each, each individual actually has his own views on this, so I don't want to broad brush it too much. But the general trend is one that's restrictive about immigration inside the House. And yet inside the Senate is divided, and two things have happened in the last couple of weeks that are crucial. John McCain has emerged out of his, out of his cocoon and once again is showing interest in the immigration reform that he tried to champion uh, several years ago uh, under the administration of George Bush. And then, and then you have um, um, Graham, Lindsey Graham from South Carolina, and Chuck Schumer from New York, who had been working on trying to do a comprehensive immigration reform up until uh, everybody broke off for the elections, are back at it again, but very quietly. So can this, this, this side of the Republicans um, that, that, that feels that the, they need comprehensive immigration reform for the country and for their own party as a way to re to reach out to Hispanics prevail versus the side of the Republican Party that um, feels that they are best taking a hardline position on immigration, that even that appeals to Hispanics and that's the best future for the country and their party. Um, that's one thing. Then you have the Democrats on the other side of the aisle. You know, President Obama is, is spoken out many times in favor of comprehensive immigration reform, but he's not gone to the mat to try to push it through. The closest thing we saw was in December over the DREAM Act, and that failed. Yet, um, the, 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 the Democrats owe their control of the Senate to the Hispanic vote that came out at the last minute in the West. Every poll projected that, that Harry Reid was going to lose, and he won. And he won by a very high Latino turnout that, many, that was driven in large part by the great vitriol that was taking place by in the West among some Republican candidates. And the same thing happened across the West 
in California, in Colorado, uh, in other states that allowed the Democrats to, to, to win those elections there and keep control of the Senate. But will the Democrats, who've always taken Latinos for granted, um, will they be willing to go to the ramparts and fight for immigration reform or not remains to be seen. So that's sort of like the political play in Washington today. The country itself is divided on these issues, and, and we can talk about all that later. But I think that, that the next big question is then, well, what kind of immigration reform do we need? Do we want? What really is best for the country? And that's what our panelists are here to talk about. So uh, <clears throat> I think maybe we'll just go in the order that people are, are seated here. Huh? And I think we'll begin with George Borjas. Um, and it, let me say, uh, those of you who follow immigration, we probably have the three most important scholars in the country today on immigration seated right here at this, at this panel. I mean, from my point of view, they are the best. Um, uh, George is at the Kennedy School. Um, 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 he uh, is a labor economist, and, uh, and he is the leading theorist, theoretician, on labor economy as it applies to immigration. It's a very divided field. There's a lot of fights within economics. We all say that it's about economics. We know it's about much more than economics. But economics is really what everybody talks about. It's jobs. It's you know, it's good for the country. The country grows. It's bad. Everything like that. Um, and no matter where you stand on the issue, you use George's. You cannot deal with this in economics and not use George's work. So um, I think I'll just uh, uh, introduce each of you one by one, if that's all right. Um, and begin with George. We'll fix it up. Uh, what I want to do a little bit before we start talking about reform is that it's really hard to talk about reform unless we know where we are. And what I want to do is actually spend at least five minutes sort of summarizing what current policy is what it is economists think we know about the impact of immigration, and then proceed, given that context, to discuss what it is we should be going. And uh, let me actually start with a little anecdote, because there are really two questions that I want to ask at the beginning. We should frame the debate. And the anecdote is a, is a true one, which is nice. And it goes back all the way to January 1979, when Jimmy Carter was president. And he invited Deng Xiaoping to the White House for a state visit. It was the very first time that such a high-level official from China had ever visited the U.S. And Deng Xiaoping couldn't wait to get his hands on Deng Xiaoping. I'm sorry, Jimmy Carter couldn't wait to get Deng Xiaoping in the Oval Office to give him a piece of his mind about human rights in China. And Jimmy Carter literally brought a big briefing book to the, White, to the Oval Office to go over all these human rights issues in China. And somewhere in that briefing book was a page on the right of the Chinese people to emigrate. In other words, as you, all of you know, Many communist countries prohibited their citizens from leaving. And Jimmy Carter was going to tell Deng Xiaoping, how could you consider yourself to be a so-called civilized nation if you don't let your people go? So once Jimmy Carter said that, Deng Xiaoping sat back for a little bit and thought about it and said, you know, Mr. President, you're absolutely right. How many Chinese nationals do you want? 10 million? 20 million? 30 million? True quote. Now, needless to say, that's the end of the whole discussion of our immigration from China to the US and the right of the Chinese people to leave the country. Now, the reason that's an important issue is because Jim, Deng Xiaoping, unlike Jimmy Carter, actually put his finger on a crucial question that underlies any immigration policy. And every time you talk about immigration reform in the current context, you almost never, ever hear this question asked. Nevertheless, the crucial one, how many people do we want? The fact of the matter is we're going to have to limit the number because many, many more people want to come to the US than we're willing to accept. And therefore, there will have to be, and I'm going to use the word in the old-fashioned sense, there will have to be discrimination, whether we like it or not. A policy, by definition, discriminates among the many applicants. We can argue about which method of discrimination we want to use. Should it be based on national origin? Should it be based on skills? or economic status, where you come from, all kinds of things, right? But we're going to have to discriminate, whether we like it or not. That's just part of what immigration policy is about. We have to choose a number. 
how many immigrants we want. Suppose that Jimmy Carter had actually just given this question five seconds of thought before the meeting with Deng Xiaoping. He could have decided maybe we want to meet, I don't know, 10 million, 20 million, 30 million Chinese nationals over the next 20, 10, 20 years. And then Deng Xiaoping could have sat back a little more and thought about it and said, well, which 10 million do you want? We have a billion people to choose from. And that's another crucial question or debate, which again, you never hear addressed. The fact of the matter is that many more people will want to come to the US than we're willing to admit. And not only will we have to set limits, but we will have to discriminate in the sense that we have to pick and choose. We, so immigration policy have to set a numerical limit, and we'll have to set a set of rules that award some people those lucky visas and unfortunately leaves everybody else behind. And that's just the heart of the matter. Now, needless to say, we can argue about immigration reform for the next two hours and in fact for the next two years. And almost never will you hear those questions discussed uh, loudly. And the reason is that by asking those questions, you're really asking a much more fundamental question which is, what is immigration policy going to do for us? What is that we want to accomplish from immigration policy? What kind of country are we? That's, a, that's really the, the kind of question at the core. And I'm gonna, what I want to do now is take a little detour into economics, just five minutes, and show you what I think it is we know that we tend to sort of not completely agree on, but sort of roughly agree on, and then return to these two questions at the end with the context of, of what we know in mind. In other words, what, do, what kind of empirical findings and theoretical results do we have that would allow us to answer those two questions? So let me uh, get started by basically telling you about immigration. All of you know that immigration is large, not just in the US, but all over the world. And in fact, the US is by no means an exceptional country in any sense. There are many countries that have a much higher proportion of foreign born than the US does and there are some countries that have a fewer proportion. So the notion that, quote unquote, we are a nation of immigrants is really not true in the, current, in the modern context. In fact, if you think about it long, you know, way, way, way back, every nation is a nation of immigrants. It's just a matter of timing. And a lot of European countries became nations of immigrants very recently. Uh, this is the number of legal immigrants by decade in the US, and you can see the, the, the peaks and, and, and declines. The first peak, of course, was the Ellis Island movement back in the early 1900s. Uh, soon thereafter, there were policy shifts that I will talk about in a minute. The Great Depression and those policy shifts basically reduced immigration down to nothing by the 1930s. And since then, it's been going up over time. We're basically admitting about, and, this, and the crucial word here, which is in, in italics there, is legal. This is the number of legal immigrants. We're roughly admitting about a million legal immigrants per year these days. Uh, I'll, I'll, the history, I'll just, put a bullet point with four little regimes, but let me just say the following. You can go to the library and you will find volumes that, that extend for thousands of pages on the, on the history of US immigration policy. To reduce that to four bullet points is PowerPoint magic and nothing more. Clearly there's a lot more left out than is there, but basically that's the way the system works. Before, I, before 75, if you could somehow get into the US alive, you were a legal immigrant. There were no restrictions. Between 75 and 24, 1924, Congress began to enact an ever-increasing number of restrictions. And by 1924, the list was quite long, including some of the groups I have on the slide. In 1924, for the very first time, Congress sat down and legislated the answer to the two questions I posed. They put a numerical limit, and they decided on the allocation scheme of visas by looking at national origin. So depending on, the, on your national origin, you could either be lucky or not. And since 1965, we basically have a system with, again, another numerical limit, but it basically using family preferences as a way to, be, to let people in or not. In addition to that, we have a lot of illegal immigration. And these are the numbers from illegal immigrants estimated by the, the Department of Homeland Security. Right now, we have about 10 or 11 million people estimated, uh, estimated to live illegal in the US. So altogether, you can more or less say between 1 and 1.3, 1.4 million people, legal and illegal, enter the US every year, roughly speaking. Uh, let me, this is immigration in the workforce, obviously, going up over time. Now, this is really the reason that we have an immigration debate. If you were to graph the percent wage differential between immigrants and natives 
This is what it looks like. And this is not using any fancy econometrics. This is just tabulation from the census. The fact of the matter is that for many, many, many reasons, uh, immigrants used to do very well back in the 60s, and now they don't do so well. Uh, this is immigrants in the census, which means that it's whoever gets counted, meaning it includes, it includes both legal and illegal. Uh, but that's basically the trend. And what you can see is that there's been a pretty substantial decline in the relative economic status of immigrants. Now, the reason that this is the source of the debate is because there are two questions that immediately come up once you, set the, once you see this fact. The first question is, what do immigrants do to the US labor market when they come in? And that's a question about which there has been a lot of debate. And uh, let me just put up a little, a little table showing you what I did in a paper with Larry Katz in the Econ Department at Harvard, sort of summarizing the impact by skill group. And basically, it depends on whether you look in the short run, which is the day after they arrive, or you look in the long run, which is, theoretically speaking, after the economy has complete time to adjust to everything that could happen. Economics has nothing to say about whether the short run and long run are one day or 10, year, 10 years, or as Keynes said, in the long run, we're all dead. We just don't know the span of time. But we know that's what would happen at the beginning and at the end after the immigration sort of works itself for the system. And the, bas the basic result that you tend to see from all these studies, and people disagree with the numbers, and we could talk about all the methodological controversies involved in this, but the basic result you tend to sort of come up with that's rememberable is that the people who've lost out of immigration in the US tend to be low skill workers, in particular high school dropouts. You might say that's not a lot of people. Nevertheless, they're the people that we tend to design a lot of, lot of anti-poverty programs for. And the reason that it works that way is because immigration in the US, from that slide that I showed you earlier, has become progressively less skilled, for whatever reason. And that tends to affect low skilled workers more. Now, you can say also it's not that big an impact. And it's not. It's 5%. And you know, the lead is between 5 and 8%, depending on the, on the length of time that you allow the economy to adjust to this. A typical high school dropout in the US makes about $20,000 a year. So we're talking about $1,000 a year. Uh, roughly speaking, the size of the EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit. So the two programs basically outweigh each other, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, the other thing that matters is uh, when you talk about illegal immigration, which people worry about a lot, is the welfare system sort of the fiscal impact of immigration. Now again, there's a lot of controversy over this, but one fact is basically undeniable. And the fact that's basically undeniable is that if you look at immigrant households, they tend to have higher usage rates than native households. Now that is not shocking. That is not to say that immigrants come to the US in search of welfare. It is simply to say that when you have a lot of low skill immigrants coming in, low skill immigrants tend to be the type of people, whether foreign-born or not, who qualify and participate in these programs. These programs are designed specifically for low skill workers. So it shouldn't be completely shocking, and it says nothing whatsoever about the, the work ethic of immigrants, that when people qualify for something, they tend to use it. And that's basically the gap in between immigrant and native usage rates in welfare. Now let me turn to the policy reforms that people talk about. And let me ask a very simple question. Suppose you believe what I've just summarized, that we have low skill immigration, that low skill immigrants have an impact in the low skill labor market, and that low skill immigrants have a fiscal impact because they tend to participate more in welfare programs. The question still is left on, on answer, which is, what does all this imply about US immigration policy? What would it imply about the current debate for reform and how should we reform the system? In which way should we change policy? If we admit it, just postulate that those findings are correct, in which change should we change policy to take account of those facts? And what I'm going to say is the way to change policy may surprise some of you if you haven't heard me before. But the answer is, it implies nothing at all. Now, that is a very anti-social science way of saying things, because most social scientists like to believe they can solve all the world's problems. But in fact, all these findings and all these empirical studies say nothing whatsoever about how we should reform immigration policy. Just to give you an example, suppose you believe that in fact immigrants come to the US and use a lot of welfare, a lot of welfare and public assistance. 
what does that imply about policy? Well, it depends on you, what you have in mind. Suppose I were a very uh, native-oriented person and cared about native taxpayers quite a bit. If I see immigrants coming in using a lot of welfare, I say to the native taxpayer, you're getting pretty, you know, you're not so well off anymore. And if I had any power, then I would say we should restrict the entry of low skilled immigrants. So that's one policy implication of that empirical result. Let me put another hat on. Suppose that we're a very humanitarian person, and I care about policy all over the world. And a poor pe about, I care about poverty all over the world, and about poor people from no, no matter where they come from. One way to think of immigration policy, and in fact, it's probably the best way to think about immigration policy today, is that it's probably the biggest anti-poverty program the universe has ever seen. And in that context, the fact that they come here and get on welfare, well, that's, that's fine and dandy. That's exactly what we want them to do. We're helping them out. So the, 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 the same fact is consistent with any policy you want to do, depending on what your policy objective is. I mean, on the one hand, I should get rid of the immigrants because they use welfare if I really care about native taxpayers. On the other hand, I should welcome them even more because it means the system is working and I'm providing a lot of assistance to these people. So the point I want to make is that these empirical findings have nothing whatsoever to say about policy in the absence of another question. And the other question you have to address, which we never want to say out loud what it is, is who are you rooting for? If you're rooting for native taxpayers, the fact that immigrants use welfare is a very bad thing. If you're rooting for the immigrants themselves or in terms of their, their poverty status abroad, it's a very, you know, we want to help them out. So the crucial question that often underlies what most social scientists say about immigration reform is that they, what they never tell you out loud, who they're rooting for. Believe me, every time I hear a social scientist speaking about immigration, they will point out numbers and numbers and tables and graphs, and in my head, I sort of wash all that off and read in between the lines. Because in between the lines, there is an, un an unadmitted assumption that they're rooting for a particular group. That particular group may be the immigrants, or the natives, or employers, or Microsoft in case of the H-1B visas, or the engineers, or whoever. But they will never quite say out loud who they're rooting for. But nevertheless, every single implication that they want to make in policy changes has to do with that question, who they're rooting for. Now, let me talk about reform. What does that imply about any of this? Well, let me tell you what I have to admit to myself before I even say anything about reform. Who am I rooting for? Well, I really don't know. If I, from, my, from an economic point of view, I don't really care because the evidence is the evidence regardless of what you're rooting for. But to apply those findings, I have to, internally I have to decide what is it that I want immigration to do? Now, I personally, and this is a complete personal opinion, I personally see nothing wrong whatsoever with saying immigration should do the best, to do whatever is best for the country, the US. Now, some people will disagree with that, and of course, you're entitled to. But I personally see nothing whatsoever wrong with saying let's design an immigration policy that makes the US better off. Once you accept that as the goal, then all these findings do have implications. But again, that goal may be highly debatable and could be morally objectionable to many people. But it's my personal goal. But I am willing to admit it. I am help, I'm willing to help US workers particularly say. With that in mind, then the fact that immigrants come in and that, uh, that they hurt the low skilled labor market, well, you know, you can do better than that. We know from economics that there's a lot of complementarity between skills and capital, and therefore admitting more skilled immigrants will do a lot for the economy, as opposed to admitting unskilled immigrants. So the movement to a point system will be something that if you believe that goal were right, will be the one you would follow. Now, in the McCain-Bush uh, reform and Kennedy of five, six years ago that completely failed in the Senate, they had actually begun the movement towards a point system. They had actually instituted, uh, put some regulations in there that would allow people to come in. In other words, those questions of who to let in by a formula, and a formula based on education or whatever, like Canada does, for example. Now, in terms of uh, 
in, let, me, let me just say one more thing before the end, because I know we're running out of time. You can think of immigration policy as catering to many different constituencies. There are natives, and among the natives, we have native workers and native firms. There are people left behind that we have to worry about. And there are the immigrants themselves. It is pretty much impossible to design an immigration policy that benefits everybody. I mean, some groups are going to get hurt as a result of whatever choice you make. And this is the, this is the point where the who are you rooting for comes in. In order to design an immigration policy, you really first have to address the question of what it is you want immigration to do for you. Whose well-being do you want to maximize? So the next time you hear a politician or a social scientist uh, explain to you why we should move in this direction, reading between the lines, and believe me, you will find in there the seed of something that he doesn't want to admit, which is that he's rooting for this group as opposed to the other group. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. <clears throat> well, uh, um, our next speaker is unfortunately um, at Princeton. We wish we were here. Uh, uh, Doug Massey, um, who is kind of like a, a gold standard in the field, uh, professor of sociology and public affairs. Um, his books, uh, I know I've, you know, I've assigned his own book, his books in, in my own class, and, uh, and, and he may be the most cited um, uh, 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 researcher, uh, sociologist, uh, on, and, and I, I, actually, for many years, I thought you were a demographer, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, uh, um, uh, and in part because of this wonderful research project he's been doing out of Mexico, where it's following uh, Mexican migrants coming to the United States long term for many, many, many years. Uh, and it's produced remarkable results and continues to do so. Uh, and he continues to write and continues to challenge us all on so many of these issues. Doug. Well, as you might imagine, uh, George and I see the world in very different ways. Uh, and presumably, that's why you're all here, to witness the fireworks. Rather than um, go through a uh, point-by-point uh, point, uh, contestation of some of the things George said, let me just lay out my view of the current circumstances, and perhaps the third speaker can adjudicate between us. Um, <laughs> when you look around the world today, uh, what's remarkable is not that there are so many migrants, but there are so few. Uh, in the world today, only 3% of the entire world's population is outside of the country, borders of the country of their birth. Uh, and if you look at this 3%, uh, about 1.5%, uh, uh, about half of that 3% are uh, people who are displaced to uh, the immediately closest a country through violence or ecological problems or ethnic strife or something like that. Only about 1.5% uh, 1, 1 of the world's population is an immigrant in the way we generally think of immigrants, somebody who's willfully moving across uh, a border, uh, usually from south to north, in order to uh, improve their welfare. Uh, given the rampant inequalities, the rampant forces that uh, might seem to produce immigration around the world today, the fact that uh, only 1 to 3 percent of the population uh, responds, has responded by becoming an immigrant, is really quite remarkable. Uh, in the United States, uh, uh, the may, we take in, as George said, about a million legal immigrants per year. We currently have an undocumented population of around 11 million persons living in the United States. Uh, of that uh, 11 million people living in the United States, 60% are Mexicans. And uh, of the rem remainder, uh, most are from Latin America. About 20% are from Central America, and another 5 to 10% are from uh, elsewhere in uh, the Western Hemisphere. So it's really uh, the problem of undocumented migration, the, the, uh, the, the regulation of people coming in without authorization, uh, is really a problem of this hemisphere. 60% uh, of um, uh, the population, as I said, is Mexican. Uh, uh, when you look around the world, under 2% are from China, under 2% are from India. So it's really a phenomenon of this hemisphere. 
how did we get into the current circumstance where we have 11 million people out of status, we have a tide, a wave of xenophobia such that we haven't seen since the 1920s. Uh, Anti-immigrant attitudes and expressions are more commonplace now than I've seen at any point in my, my professional or even my uh, natural born life. Um, uh, I think the key date goes back to uh, uh, 1965, and to understand what happened in 1965, you need to understand a little bit about what was going on before. Uh, in, 19, in the 1930s, as George's graph showed, immigration was dead, deader than a doornail. Not partly because of policy, but uh, mostly because there were no jobs in the U.S. There was no labor demand in the U.S. There were no labor moving anywhere in the world in the 1930s. Uh, uh, in 1942, the United States uh, found itself at war and began to incur labor shortages. Uh, those Okies that were flooding into the farm fields in the 1930s and depicted in the Grapes of Wrath were being drafted or going into military uh, production facilities and unionized jobs in California, and they weren't working in the fields anymore. So the United States set up a guest worker program known as the Bracero Program to bring in temporary workers. This program steadily expanded, uh, and in the 1950s, the late 1950s, basically 55 to 60, we're bringing in about 450,000 workers per year uh, from Mexico on temporary work visas, and uh, uh, the national origin quotas that George referred to that were implemented in the 1920s never applied to the Western Hemisphere. There was no numerical limit on the number of migrants who could enter from countries like Mexico or anywhere else in the Americas uh, in the late 1950s. And so there were 50,000 Mexicans per year coming in and taking permanent residence. So about half a million Mexicans per year were coming into the United States under legal auspices in the late 1950s. Um, 1965 is a key uh, date because in that year, Congress passed amendments to the Immigration and Nationality Act, which abandoned uh, the ban on Asian immigration, abandoned the ban on African immigration, and abandoned the uh, discriminatory national origins quotas that had been imposed on Europe in the 1920s, uh, and substituted a supposedly uh, neutral or eth uh, uh, ethnic blind, racial blind, uh, new system where each country in the world gets 20,000 visas. Um, it's not exactly a fair system since uh, Andorra gets 20,000 visas and People's Republic of China gets 20,000 visas. So uh, obviously the access of Andorans to American visas is much greater than Chinese. But we'll leave that aside. They had no intent to discriminate. And they were in fact trying to remove the intent to discriminate. It was more of a civil rights reform than an immigration reform in 1965. But what many people don't realize is that the 1965 amendments also began to phase in the first ever numerical limits on migration from the Western Hemisphere. The 1965 Act uh, phased in a, a, a hemispheric ceiling of 120,000 visas uh, per year uh, for the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and um, that took place in 1968. It was finally implemented in 1968. By 1976, the Western Hemisphere was put under the 20,000 per country visa cap, like the rest of the world. So beginning in 1965, we began to ratchet down the number of permanent residence visas accessible to people in the, in the uh, Western Hemisphere. 1965, also the United States, uh, based on legislation in 1964, terminated the guest worker program that had been in place for 22 years. It ended the Bracero program. So by the uh, in the end of the 1950s, you had half a million Mexicans coming in legally per year, 450,000 temporary, 50,000 permanent. Uh, by uh, the late 1970s, you had no guest worker program, zero, and uh, legal visas were capped at 20,000 persons per year. Uh, the 22 years of the Bracero program had uh, established a well-institutionalized, well uh, uh, a governed uh, labor system of circular migration between Mexico and the United States. And so not surprisingly, when the legal avenues for entry to the United States were curtailed after 1965, uh, the flows didn't simply stop. They just continued under other auspices. And from 65 through the late 1970s, we see a sustained increase in undocumented or illegal migration to the United States. 
Uh, by the late 1970s, the flows had basically reestablished themselves at about the same level as was occurring in the late 1950s. Only now, the vast majority were migrating under undocumented auspices. This uh, uh, was ex is extremely important in under understanding what came next. The fact that suddenly half a million people are coming into the United States every year in illegal status uh, opened a huge political door for political entrepreneurs, politicians, and for bureaucratic entrepreneurs because you can use the fact that so many people are illegal to mobilize resources and mobilize pop, uh, popular political support, mobilize nativist political support in particular. Uh, the fact that immigrants were illegal, by definition, made them lawbreakers. By definition, they were criminals. And in the context of the Cold War, they became proto-communist uh, insurgents. In the context of the war on terror, they become proto-terrorists. And they really become symbols in a, in, a, in, a, in a political debate that has a lot more to do with domestic American politics than anything to do with the realities of immigration in this hemisphere. So after 1965, we find the rise of the Latino threat narrative in American media, and we find the, f the increasing frequency of the use of framings of migration as, as, uh, as invasions, as floods, uh, as a crisis. And uh, uh, so uh, the fact that so many migrants are illegal uh, creates opportunities to promote an anti-immigrant reaction, which occurs. As the anti-immigrant reaction takes hold, uh, it, more and more pressure is brought on policymakers to make even more restrictive legislation. Uh, they increase uh, border enforcement, they increase internal deportations, and they make uh, opportunities for legal immigration more difficult. Uh, so uh, every, uh, uh, every time there's an anti-immigrant reaction, it produces uh, an increase in enforcement, which increases the number of apprehensions. More apprehensions uh, proves that you need to have more uh, enforcement because the task still, the immigrants still, illegal immigration still rising, rising. So it cycles back and forth. It becomes a feedback loop, even though the number of entries, undocumented entries, had stabilized by the late 1970s. There was no secular increase in the number of undocumented entries between Mexico and the United States between the late 1970s and 2000. Uh, what changed was the number of apprehensions, and that was totally a function of the resources we're putting into the process of catching undocumented migrants. And it became a self-justifying system that produced ever more punitive, ever more um, uh, uh, repressive policies in the United States. Um, we militarized the border uh, beginning in 1986 with the passage of the Immigration Reform and Control Act. We amped up the militarization of the border in 1993 with the launching of Operation Blockade in El Paso. 1994, launching of Operation Gatekeeper in, um, in San Diego. These were the two busiest border crossing points that were responsible for 80 to 85 percent of all border crossings at the time. Um, <clears throat> As we ramped up enforcement in these areas, we diverted the flows away from California, in particular out into the Sonoran Desert, in through Arizona. Prior to 1994, nobody crossed in Arizona. It was a quiet sector on the border, and Arizona was not a destination for undocumented migrants. Uh, the three big destinations were California, Texas, and Illinois. Uh, uh, after 1993, suddenly all the flows were channeling through uh, the Sonoran Desert into Arizona, and Arizona became ground zero in the war on immigrants. Uh, eventually, they militarized the border in Arizona, and so now they're actually coming in through the southern Rio Grande Valley. But uh, nothing had changed in terms of the numbers. Only the locus of border crossing had changed. Nonetheless, this reinforced the dynamic of you know, a border out of control that uh, illegal migrants were in a brand new invasion. 20,000 illegal migrants arriving per week in Tijuana and crossing into San Diego don't make a big impression in a broader population that's overwhelmingly Mexican and uh, in, numbered in the, the, the joint metro areas of around uh, eight, seven or eight million. Uh, 20,000 migrants arriving per week in Douglas, Arizona, well, about 25,000 people, they make a big impression. And when they cross across, go across open ranch land uh, in southern Arizona, they make a big impression, uh, even though the numbers really hadn't changed. Uh, once they were diverted away from California, they just kept on going. And uh, after 93, 94, there was a 
huge uh, transformation of the geography of immigration, whereby immigrants began avoiding California and settling everywhere else, going everywhere else in the United States. So after 93, 94, the most important immigrant receiving destinations are North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, Georgia, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, 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 Nebraska, Iowa, uh, Min uh, Minnesota. Uh, According to the, 98, the 1990 census, uh, of all Mexicans who entered the U.S. between 85 and 90, two-thirds went to California. Ten years later, between 95 and 2000, one-third went to California. And that has persisted. Between 2000 and 2005, one-third. Between 2005 2010, one-third. A permanent deviation of Mexicans away from the state of California to everywhere else in the U.S. Uh, so the net effect of uh, the border policy was to completely reorder the geography of immigration. Finally, uh, 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 if, if you push people away from crossing in nice urban areas like Juarez to El Paso or Tijuana to San Diego, you push them out in the middle of Sonoran Desert, very hostile territory. There aren't any large population centers. It drives up the costs of migration. According to our estimates, they've gone from about $500 uh, crossing to uh, about $3,000 a crossing. So you've uh, increased the, uh, uh, the, um, the cost of crossing by about six, a factor of six. Um, and you dramatically increased the risks of border crossing. The death rate essentially tripled uh, among uh, at, uh, border crossers uh, after the launching of the blockades in 93, 94. Uh, uh, what, what does a logical migrant do, a rational uh, migrant do? Uh, if you suddenly drive up the cost of border crossing, they minimize border crossing. And they do this not by staying home and not coming to the U.S. Rather, they minimize border crossing by staying, hunkering down and staying in the U.S. once they've paid the upfront costs, run the gauntlet to the border, experienced the risks. And moreover, now instead of, uh, of a $500 uh, upfront cost they have to pay off to make the trip profitable, they got to stay to pay off $3,000. So if you make $500 a month in the, under the old regime, you would stay one month and then you're free and clear. Under the new regime, you have to stay six months before you're free and clear before you can even go home with a profit. Uh, so the net effect of uh, the militarization of the border, uh, and remember again that uh, uh, the actual number of undocumented entries is not changing over this period of time. The net effect of the militarization of the border was to dramatically reduce the rate of return migration. We didn't affect the rate of in-migration. We dramatically lowered the rate of out-migration from the United States. And the net effect was to double the net rate of undocumented migration to the U.S. in the um, uh, period from 19, uh, uh, basically from 1985 up to, 19, uh, up to 2000. And so that's really the origin of our large undocumented population into the United States. Uh, it very much has to do with our uh, simultaneous decision, first, to restrict opportunities for legal entry after 1965, and then after 1985 to begin militarizing the border. Of course, this occurs also in the context of ongoing integration between Mexico, Canada, and the United States under NAFTA. So even though we're uh, militarizing the border, we're lowering the barriers to cross-border movements of goods, capital, information services, and many kinds of people. But magically, within the integrated North American economy we're creating, we want to have an economy where all factors of production are mobile except one. Uh, and, uh, and to finesse this, we militarized the border. Uh, and it backfired. It didn't work. Um, so where are we now? Um, where we are now? is uh, that surprisingly uh, we've accomplished most of the elements of immigration reform without even really knowing it. Uh, four elements that uh, uh, constitute uh, comprehensive immigration reform. First, we've got to get control of the border. Uh, well, in point of fact, illegal migration to the United States fell to a net of zero in 2008 and has been negative since then. Between 2008 and 2009, the size of the undocumented population of the United States fell by about a million persons. Between 2009 and 2010, it more or less remained stable. So uh, 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 illegal migration has stopped. For the first time in 60 years, the border is, in fact, under control. Uh, second. Uh, we really need to increase the size of the quotas 
for Mexico and Canada. It's absolutely insane that we have uh, a free trade agreement and we are integrating North American economy uh, and Mexico in particular. It's a 110 million person uh, country, a $1 trillion economy, our second largest trading partner, uh, 60 years of history of continuous migration between Mexico and the United States and uh, they get the same uh, quota allocation of 20,000 visas as Botswana. Uh, it, it makes no sense on the face of it. Um, but, and so we haven't, we haven't actually statutorily changed the um, uh, number of uh, visas eligible uh, to, for Mexicans and other people in the Western Hemisphere, but they themselves have taken matter into their own hands. Prompted by Congress, which has turned up the heat not only on illegal migrants, but on legal immigrants, uh, and uh, started stripping away rights and privileges from legal immigrants to the United States, and started and, and, and denying them access to many entitlements in the United States, uh, Congress has pushed decisively uh, groups like Mexicans towards naturalization, and naturalization rates have skyrocketed in these populations. The thing about naturalization is it creates entitlements for entry under the family unification provisions. So every time you create a new citizen, you create new legal immigrants down the road. So a permanent resident of the United States has the right to petition for the entry of spouse and minor children subject to numerical limitations, this 20,000 per country visa cap. Uh, if that person goes on to become a U.S. citizen, uh, suddenly spouse and children come in uh, outside the quotas. They get out of the line, they come right in. Moreover, the new citizen acquires the right to sponsor the entry of parents without numerical limitation. And, and, uh, uh, and he acquires the right to sponsor the entry of brothers and sisters and older married children subject to numerical limitation. So the more people that become citizens, the more people enter the United States. And so even though the cap's 20,000 or so per year, uh, the number of Mexicans entering is 150 to 200,000 people per year. So we've already, they de facto increased the caps for themselves. Third uh, pillar of the immigration reform is a guest worker program. Well, uh, even as the Border Patrol is very much making a big show of border enforcement and calling press conferences, Congress has quietly increased the size of the guest worker program that we do have, the H visa program. Uh, uh, and now in, in 2008, there were 350,000 uh, guest worker entries from Mexico to the United States, the largest guest worker entry since the Bracero program in the late 1950s. And so this brings us uh, to the, the current situation. We've got the border under control. We've already put in place a guest worker program. The immigrants themselves have manufactured their own bigger visa quotas. Uh, and so the only thing left is what do we do with the large undocumented population that's here? Uh, currently enumerated at 11 million people. What I've been advocating is that this population be divided into two basic groups. Those who entered as minors, as children, who have no criminal record should be given an immediate and unconditional amnesty because they didn't do anything wrong. Uh, and uh, if they have no criminal record, they've apparently kept their noses clean. And there's no moral reason why we shouldn't give them uh, uh, a, uh, an unconditional amnesty. It's as if I went out and robbed a 7-Eleven and then they jailed my daughter. Uh, uh, I made the decision to rob the 7-Eleven, not my daughter. Uh, so we don't punish the children for the sins of the parents. Uh, I think it's a fundamental principle that Americans can agree upon. Uh, the rest of the population, and, and that population is probably out of the 3 million, 3, out of the 11 million, 3 million or so. The rest of the population, um, I advocate an earned legalization program where uh, uh, people, uh, you set, aside, set out a series of pro-social behaviors, learning English, taking civics classes, paying taxes, uh, whatever you want, they earn the points over time and they qualify to adjust status to permanent residence. And then if you want to punish them for their law-breaking past, you fine them. The immigration uh, uh, violations are civil, mostly civil penalties and not crim criminal actions. So you fine them, 3,000 bucks, 5,000 bucks. Then you let them pay their debt to society and move on. I think this is the only rational and humane way to proceed. One final point uh, about the skills debate that George mentioned. Um, I do not favor a point system. The point system in Canada has not been very successful. In fact, in many ways, it's a dismal failure. Uh, uh, what I had, we, we already have a good uh, uh, skill system. We attract lots and lots of people with H2 uh, visas and H1 visas 
that are highly skilled people. The problem is when their temporary visas run out, there's nowhere for them to go under current immigration law. There should be a special category in US immigration law for, a, for skilled worker visas adjusting status to permanent resident. Uh, we do a much better job of integrating our skilled workers into our economy than either Canada or Australia. We bring them in on temporary work visas. They come in through skilled uh, requirements. They establish connections with the US labor market. When it comes time to adjust status, they have a job. They are integrated in the United States, and it's just that we don't have any place to put them. So if I were the czar of immigration, those are the things that I would do. Thanks, Doug. Well, I, uh, uh, Mary Waters has almost been given a, a, an introduction as the um, as the uh, adjudicator here. <laughs> Mary, I know that, that's a, that's a that's a, a, um, a tremendous responsibility to take between these two men. But uh, it sort of reflects uh, the respect that everybody has for Mary. She's a sociologist here at Harvard, um, and uh, um, um, uh, and I can say that for you know throughout the country, and everybody who has anything to do with this debate always says if they want to have somebody that you feel that you can trust, you like, you want to hear what she has to say. She's, she's so respected for her work as, as Mary Waters. And, and her book, and let me say that, the, you know, um, and each of these have written books that are the, you know, it's economy and, and in, in, in uh, um, demography and, in, and now Mary in sociology that are the, um, you know, the, the key textbooks in their fields. Um, you know, Mary City, a book on inheriting the city that she did with some co-authors about New York City on second generation integration is just, I think, the best thing you can read uh, if you want to learn about this subject and what's happening with second generation immigrants. Mary. Thank you, Edward. Um, I need to get this. All right, thank you. And uh, I am not going to um, <laughs> adjudicate between these two guys. They can slut, uh, slug it out um, in the uh, question and answer, and uh, uh, I can join the fray, I think. Um, uh, what I want to do is to talk about um, uh, a little bit differently than, than the two previous speakers. I want to talk about the debate about immigration and how taking um, a long view and a comparative view and a more academic view, um, I think, uh, informs this debate and also uh, uh, leads to different kinds of conclusions than you'll, you'll hear if you uh, turn on the television or, or look in the newspaper. Um, and so in taking the long view, um, I want to talk about a couple of different issues. One, um, demography and destiny. Um, and I want to uh, point out that um, the U.S. Uh, and most uh, developed countries, uh, and especially in Western Europe, uh, are aging. We're all getting older, uh, and we're having fewer children. And the aging of that population and the need for replacement workers and consumers not only sets up a need uh, for uh, uh, immigrants, and for, for uh, new workers to take over, but also sets up uh, a situation that is quite different, I think, than the way that George framed the issue about immigration. Uh, I think he was setting it up really as a zero-sum game, that somebody had to lose and somebody had to win. Uh, and I think that um, uh, uh, Richard Alba has written a, a recent book on um, blurring the color line in which he, he makes the argument that non-zero sum mobility is what is going to characterize the next few decades in the United States because of the retirement of the baby boom uh, generation. And there are going to be a lot of skilled jobs that are going to need to be replaced uh, with both um, uh, uh, young natives and also immigrants. Um, and so I'm not sure that it needs to be uh, set up as a, a zero sum game. Uh, and the same kinds of arguments have been made by Dow Myers um, in Immigrants and Boomers. Um, the second point I want to make and, um, on uh, the long view is that assimilation 
not only has worked in the past, but is working now in the United States. Uh, immigrants are coming in. They and their children are learning English. They are making more money the more years that they're here. They are fitting into our culture and, in fact, contributing a great deal to our culture. And there is a great deal of socioeconomic mobility, especially if you take a long view over generations. Um, it may not be, it, you can argue a, about whether or not the glass is half full or half empty, uh, whether it's as rapid as you would like it to be, but there certainly is progress vis-a-vis uh, -vis their parents and vis-a-vis -vis, um, native-born Americans. And uh, finally, um, I want to talk about what the long view might say about the situation that Doug just described, about the growth of undocumented immigrants, and um, really argue that uh, a long view uh, points to the toxic nature for our democracy of having so many undocumented people in our country, and the long run way in which undocumented status of parents really leads to um, a, a lack of equality of opportunity uh, for their children, even if they themselves are uh, born here and citizens. So the first thing, uh, the demography, the retirement of the baby boom, um, there are uh, many baby boomers, uh, such as myself. Uh, I was born in uh, 1957, which was the, the year in which the most people, um, uh, the peak of the baby boom, um, and uh, People uh, born in the decade before that and the decade afterwards uh, are aging and beginning, the first wave of the baby boom is beginning to retire. Um, they are emptying um, jobs and they are also uh, aging the population. Uh, I, when I was interviewing uh, people for my book, Black Identities, I was interviewing young uh, uh, people in high school. And I asked this one young woman uh, what her mother did for a living. And she said, well, you know, the white people don't like to take care of their own old people. So they need immigrant people to do it. And that's what my mom does. And um, that young woman actually was capturing uh, what is a growth field uh, for immigrants and uh, uh, what is a, a true problem for most of the developed countries um, uh, as they look forward. Um, uh, uh, as the population ages. Um, secondly, immigrants are both consumers and workers. Um, and I think you can look at the history since 1965 of many American cities, which uh, many sociologists were seeing decay and decline uh, in urban areas. And the influx of immigrants really revitalized those neighborhoods and cities. And um, uh, if you think that the housing um, uh, crisis is a, a bust right now. Imagine what it would be uh, without immigrants coming in. And uh, these are just some, uh, some graphs from Dal Meyer's uh, book on um, immigrants and boomers. Uh, the red line is California and the black line is the US. And this is the increase in the number of uh, people, uh, uh, the ratio of uh, seniors to the working population. Um, and this is the rise in the senior ratio by states. And you can see that uh, as all of us get older, uh, there are going to be a need for uh, younger workers who will be paying into Social Security and uh, taking care of us in the nursing homes. Um, uh, the the a whole debate about the rise of the deficit and the um, entitlements that are out of control is really tied to this issue of um, uh, the aging of the population, and yet in me most of the debates that you're hearing about, you're not hearing about uh, the, the um, uh, increase in the number of younger workers that come from immigrants and the higher fertility of immigrants, and you're also not hearing about the 11 million people, uh, well, not 11 million people, but the large number of undocumented people who've been paying into Social Security for a long time and ha have no way to get the money back. Uh, as Dal Myers points out, um, uh, the housing um, uh, of these baby boomers as they retire is going to come on the market. And the question is going to be who is going to be selling houses and who is going to be buying houses. And as he points out, uh, uh, whites are going to be selling houses in California and uh, um, non-whites are going to be uh, the, the buyers of those houses. Um, and he points out the... Um, the change between 1997 and 2005 in the most common surnames 
in the um, uh, California tran housing transactions. Um, and you can see uh, by 2005, Hispanics are the ones buying houses. So secondly, I want to think about, um, uh, or I want to point out that uh, the debate, um, and, and Doug and I have gone back and forth uh, talking about um, what's happening uh, in terms of uh, um, relations between uh, whites and Latinos in the U.S. Uh, over the years. And um, one of the things that I keep pointing out and, and, um, and that he, his own work shows and that, that most of the uh, work on uh, the first and second generation shows is that uh, there's relative progress of the second generation, that um, the three major studies of um, the second generation that have been done, the Children of Immigrants Longitudinal Study, the IMLA Study in Los Angeles, and the New York Study, as well as studies with the Census and CPS, show the relative progress of the second generation. Um, shows uh, almost universal shift to English by the second generation, higher intermarriage rates, residential integration of Asians and Latinos, much higher than of African Americans. Um, uh, uh, John Pitkin and Dal Myers have now come up with um, a new um, measurement looking at not assimilation but advancement over time for the first generation um, in, on different measures, on wages, on language acquisition, on um, uh, residential integration. Um, and they find for Mexicans and Asians uh, that there has been this advancement um, over time controlling for cohort and age effects. Um, so, uh, assimilation works, which you won't hear um, if you tune into uh, Lou Dobbs or to um, it, uh, the debates that are, are on talk radio, um, where people are not learning English, where people are um, uh, going on welfare and not contributing to American society. Um, and uh, the other thing that I think is very important as we frame this debate is to think about um, democracy and what it means in our society to have uh, 11 million people um, who uh, have very little rights. Um, to think about people who, um, who live here but who can't enforce fair labor laws, who can't call the police if they're um, beaten up by their husband because they're afraid of being deported, who can't report crimes because they're worried about being um, uh, found, uh, who uh, can't get health care until it's too late and they have to go to the emergency room because they don't qualify for anything, um, and uh, uh, who um, really have uh, very, very few rights at all. Um, and when you think about a historical um, analogy for them, um, it's basically the absolute numbers are about similar to the 11 and a half million people, uh, African Americans, who lived in the South right before the Civil Rights Movement. Um, we have, have the same number of people with, some might argue, even less rights um, in American society because they can't uh, go to court and challenge or they can't um, uh, challenge the, uh, when they are um, uh, not treated properly. Um, the other issue is the equality of opportunity. Doug talked about this in terms of the DREAM Act and uh, punishing the children for the sins of the, of the parents. Um, parents' undocumented status affects children. Um, it affects, of course, the children who are brought in um, uh, after they were born somewhere else and have grown up here, some of whom don't even learn that they're undocumented until they graduate from high school and um, find out from their parents that they came as infants. Um, 65,000 undocumented children graduate from high school each year with no future path in the U.S. and limited or no ties to their country of origin. Um, the IMLA study in Los Angeles was able to look at um, uh, statistically at parents who had um, uh, taken advantage of the um, uh, legalization program in 1986 and to compare people who were very comparable, parents who were comparable, who took advantage of the legalization program and those who were not able to legalize. And what they found is that even for children who were born in the U.S., and so have birthright citizenship, but who have undocumented parents, 
that there is a big difference between growing up in a household in which your parent is un undocumented or uh, your parent has legalized. And uh, they found they were more likely to drop out of high school and much less likely to graduate from college if your parents remained undocumented. Um, and this is not only a cost to the children, this is a cost to our society because, in fact, uh, we need um, uh, uh, the, the generational advancement of, of the second generation. So I also want to think about what we would um, think about this debate about immigration if we took a comparative view, view with Europe. Um, come back, coming back to the issue of demography and destiny, um, the US is actually in a better position than most Western European countries um, in terms of the aging of our population. Uh, and that is because um, of our history of immigration uh, to a great extent, not completely, but to a great extent. So the total fertility rate, the number of children per woman um, in Europe, the median total fertility rate is 1.31. And many European countries have even lower um, uh, fertility. Um, and that implies a large aging of the um, European population and uh, a decline in the actual numbers of people. Um, and the US TFR is uh, higher, it's at 2.01. And um, in part, that is because of the higher fertility of Hispanics and blacks. Um, and so not only are we adding to our population through immigration, but also through the higher fertility of Hispanics and blacks. Um, and this is not a bad thing. This is actually a good thing. Um, if we look forward in terms of um, the labor market needs that we'll have and also the dependency ratios that we're going to have going forward. Um, and this is just a, a graph comparing um, uh, the um, uh, total and elderly dependency ratios across uh, industrialized nations, and you can see uh, the, the orange is the elderly and the blue is the, re uh, is the, um, the total, uh, the child um, dependency ratios, and you can see that the U.S. has um, a lot more workers per elderly person than um, most of the countries of Western Europe. Um, the other way you can look at this is to look at um, uh, age sex pyramids, and here's Europe in 2000 and U Europe in 2040, and you can see it shrinking. The US in 2000, the US in 2040, it's still, it's shrunk a little bit, but it's still um, uh, uh, much better off than Europe. Uh, France and Germany also are seeing these declines in their population. Uh, Italy, uh, which has one of the lowest um, fertility rates, uh, and Russia, you can see, uh, are going to have a huge elderly uh, dependency ratio. A second thing that you learn by looking at uh, the, a comparative view is to think about what it means to have birthright citizenship in the United States. Um, many more European countries uh, did not have birthright citizenship 10 or 20 years ago. There's been a movement towards adopting birthright citizenship or at least a path to citizenship um, in, in most countries. Some countries are still quite behind, <coughs> like in Switzerland, uh, where everybody in your local area has to vote on whether or not you should be allowed to naturalize even if you're a second generation person born in Switzerland. Um, but what the European countries found, uh, of course, by not giving uh, citizenship to the second and even third generation. So you can go to Germany and they'll talk about the foreigners, the third generation foreigners, people whose grandparents came to Turkey. Um, I mean, came from Turkey to Germany. What you will find is that it did not cause people to go back home. It did not cause people to decide not to settle in Germany. What it did was to create sharper boundaries between Germans and foreigners. It created second class uh, non-citizens uh, in these populations and it also led to uh, much less uh, social mobility and much less integration uh, of these um, uh, children and grandchildren of immigrants than what we found in the US. Um, the other thing that you find if you compare with the United, uh, the United States with Western Europe is, and this I would 
uh, disagree with, with George on, on one of the things that he said, where he said that um, uh, all of the countries now are nations of immigrants, um, and that there's nothing special about the United States as being a nation of immigrants. Um, that may be true if you're thinking about demography and counting the numbers of people who come in, but all you need to do is to go to Europe and to, to talk to people in Europe about how they deal with their, their um, immigrants and how we approach immigration. And you can see that there really is a very um, inclusive idea still in America of what it means to be an American. So it's almost an oxymoron to think about being a uh, Moroccan French or a Turkish German. Um, you don't have those hyphenated identities because the identities themselves are really exclusive. Um, you can become German if you're from Turkish origin, but you don't keep the Turkish part. Um, you can become French, but you can't stay Moroccan um, in terms of your core identity. Um, and in the United States, it is really what we do well. Um, we incorporate people and we let them keep their identities, and yet they are full Americans. Um, uh, no one would challenge uh, the, um, the Americanness of a Vietnamese American or a Cuban American or a French American. Um, it just is not um, a strange thing to be in the United States. However, undocumented immigration is um, a wedge issue uh, that undermines support for legal immigration and creates racial ten tensions and ethnic prejudice. And I think that um, the Arizona law is an example of this, the racial profiling, the ways in which undocumented immigrants have been um, demonized and vilified on talk radio um, in debates about immigration uh, is creating racial and ethnic tensions that I think are in a race with this inclusive American identity um, and in ways that um, is very dangerous actually for the ways in which we have always been a more inclusive uh, society. Finally, I want to ask, uh, end by talking about some false policy debates that I hear and see when I read the newspaper and, and um, uh, turn on the television. Um, one is the idea that we are going to end undocumented immigration by controlling the border. Um, uh, all you need to do is to, uh, to read uh, Doug's work on this um, or, or to really think it through, um, uh, to really control our border so that we do not have undocumented immigration uh, at all. Um, would mean living in a kind of undemocratic police state that I don't think many of us would vote for um, or, or would be happy living in. Uh, the ways in which you would need to control that border and control people who have come in uh, would lead to the kind of racial profiling that the Arizona law um, uh, leads to. Uh, and um, you know, there was a great joke when they were building the um, uh, the fence along the um, uh, the border, where they said uh, the, the you know people were sending me the, the joke all along. Well, who's going to build the um, fence along the border? Well, of course it's going to be undocumented people. Who the hell else would go out in the desert in the middle of the summer and work hard all day building um, a fence? It turned out it was true. They the government subcontracted to a, um, a company, and they found out that they were hiring undocumented people to build, um, build, build the wall. Um, secondly, I also uh, uh, don't think that guest worker policies, uh, although they are appealing um, to um, uh, policymakers, and it may actually solve our problem, but I think any scholar who has studied immigration would tell you that um, a guest per worker policy will lead to leakage and will lead to uh, guest workers who become permanent uh, workers. That's been true of um, guest worker policies um, in democracies. I mean, you can control it if you are one of the Gulf states and you deport people as soon as they become pregnant and you um, have draconian policies. But if you have a democracy and you have a guest worker policy, you are not going to have everybody going back home. And um, third, uh, uh, English-only laws uh, are something that um, 
uh, people love to be for and love to debate. It's a completely um, irrelevant debate, I think, um, because uh, immigrants do want to learn English. Immigrants don't usually learn it in the first generation. It's hard. I myself have tried to learn other languages and never, never succeeded. Um, and I'm glad that I live somewhere where I don't have to speak another language. Um, but uh, the second generation learns English. The US is actually quite good at stamping out any other language other than English. Uh, we, uh, are, are, we should export our ability to make people monolingual. Um, it's quite, quite amazing how, how good we are at it. And finally, I want to just say, just because um, this is what I say to my television when I'm home alone watching the, the uh, debates, and um, I want to say it out loud, which is, what is all this stuff about, quote unquote, breaking the law, right? I could empty this room if I asked you to leave if you've smoked marijuana, if you've driven while drunk, if you've, um, sp if you've been speeding um, in your car if you have not paid your parking tickets, et cetera. And as Doug pointed out, it's not um, a felony to uh, 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 disobey the immigration law. But as a sociologist, uh, what I would tell you is that um, people don't obey laws where there is a social norm and there is um, uh, a belief that those laws are not just and where a great many people are not following those laws. Um, and so the idea that we are punishing people for being lawbreakers, uh, um, I guess I would say he who, in a, um, uh, who lives in a glass house should be the first one to throw the rock or whatever that um, <laughs> metaphor is. Uh, thank you. <laughs>Well, we had uh, um, three, two and a half different points of view. Um, uh, I wonder if I might uh, take the uh, prerogative here of the chair and, and ask a few uh, questions, one of each speaker, and I'll try to ask what I think is probably a difficult question of each um, and challenge them. Uh, and, and I think I'd like you to actually respond in reverse order so that George gets to be last uh, and has, you know, it's. You don't have the disadvantage you had the first time around of being first. Uh, Mary, um, I, I saw all your wonderful charts, uh, and we know them all about, about aging, et cetera. But isn't that really a Ponzi scheme? I mean, sooner or later, you know, everybody ages, and you've got to catch up. And yeah, I mean, that's that way for the next 10, 20, 30 years. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a house of cards, and it's unsustainable. And so at what point do you make the transition of saying that you can't use immigration as a as a policy to make up for your demographic profile. Right. Um, no, but let me, oh, okay. let, me, yeah. let me just ask the questions so you guys okay. can think about them. How's right. that? Um, um, and, and, and part of that, then, if that is the case, don't you need a guest worker program of some sort? And if so, can it be made to work? Um, uh, uh, Doug, um, circular migration died you know, a decade ago, um, at least. And so, uh, and, and as Mary pointed out, some 40% of the unauthorized immigrants didn't come across the border anyway. They came as, as uh, overstayed their visas. And so um, uh, uh, I wonder if, if, if we shouldn't, you know, that it's, 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 it's kind of time, we're, we're never going to bring that back. And if that's the case, then do, does the country have a right to uh, enforce its borders? Um, uh, and if so, then what kind of enforcement policies should the country have? What would you recommend? Um, and then, uh, uh, George, um, um, uh, um, in terms of all of your charts and, and the, the idea of the unskilled workers, um, don't we still need unskilled workers? Doesn't any economy still need them? I mean, where would the women's movement be today if we didn't have unskilled women who came in to work in the households, for instance? Where would you know, as, as, as the country has become much more educated, there is, in fact, you could argue a shortage of unskilled workers on the one hand. And then those, those, those blacks uh, and, and African Americans, mostly, you know, of the, of, of the uneducated, uh, you know, now down to about 5% uh, of the workforce uh, made up of those 4, four to 5 percent of unskilled workers, meaning high school dropouts. And don't they actually suffer from other issues that that really is not it, uh, unauthorized immigrants are competing with them. 
that these are people who have tremendous socialization problems um, um, and you're not really taking jobs away from them or if you are, uh, you're now, you've now gotten the problem down to, to such a limited small group that, that, that that's um, uh, not enough to, to, to build your policy around that, particularly when you look at the fiscal issues, you, you raise those, those fiscal concerns. I mean, for example, the, the, the national, um, uh, the, the big study that, that you and Mary both oversaw by, uh, back in the 90s, you know, showed that you know, from high school graduates and above, they actually all become fiscal contributors in their lifetime, if not even before that. So the fiscal cost is, 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 a, is not as big as it looks. And some of those costs, in fact, are investments as opposed to costs. So shall we start with Mary? Right. Um, so, so the question was whether or not uh, the, the um, uh, the issue of an aging society is really just a giant Ponzi scheme because eventually you can't bring in enough people. Uh, partly, um, uh, it's a short-term problem of a couple of decades because um, of the baby boom generation, which is this bulge uh, that, that uh, the Western European countries and the US have. So partly, it is a short ter shorter term problem with a shorter term uh, solution. Um, the, the other point, I think, is that it is not just bringing in workers, and it's not, um, it, it's not uh, uh, bringing in guest workers who then contribute and take care of the old people and then leave, uh, but in fact, the differential fertility of immigrants um, and the fact that they're, they're here permanently, uh, which actually contributes to the, um, to the, to the growth of the population. Um, and I think, uh, really, whether or not you want to say this is a policy or not, um, it's just a fact uh, that all of these, these countries are facing this issue. Uh, Japan more than any place else because Japan has controlled uh, immigration so much. Uh, and uh, I can't imagine that immigration is not going to play a large part in all of these societies um, uh, uh, facing these issues uh, because uh, there really aren't very many other alternatives uh, of, of what can be done in the short term for it. Well, with respect to circularity, uh, and Mexico in particular, uh, you're not going to go back to the status quo ante for those Mexicans who are in the United States now. Uh, they have uh, accumulated large numbers of years of uh, settlement here. They have many social and economic ties. Uh, most families are mixed in that they have uh, citizen children as well as undocumented children. Those people are not going to resume circulation. However, moving forward, there are still populations in Mexico that are perfectly happy to take uh, a, a, a circular approach. And uh, you see this uh, a, a, even now, although I illegal migration has basically gone to zero, at least on a net basis, uh, we still have uh, 300, 350,000 Mexicans circulating back and forth on temporary H visas per year. Uh, so even in the context of an ongoing recession, uh, there's demand uh, for circular migration. Uh, I agree with uh, Mary that uh, historically guest worker programs uh, have been um, exploitive. And of course, in, uh, there's always some uh, settlement that goes on. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, a circular labor program in the United States remains a viable policy option as long as you have an avenue for people who acquire legitimate ties to settle. Uh, and uh, the details uh, uh, for debate are the nature of your guest worker program. Uh, of course, employers want an indentured servitude program where the, you, they get the visas and they get to control them and allocate them to their workers. It's amazing how um, entrepreneurs suddenly forget about markets when it comes to labor. Uh, they believe in the power and the glory of the market uh, when it comes to the products and their profits and their capital allocations and so on. But when it comes to labor, they don't like labor markets. Uh, if it were up to me uh, in designing a guest worker program, I would set a target number of temporary work visas 
uh, give them to the workers themselves and let labor markets in the United States allocate supply and demand and give the temporary workers full labor rights in the United States. So it is, in theory at least, uh, perhaps not politically possible, but in theory at least possible to create a guest worker program that would serve all interests. And like Mary, I don't see it necessarily as a zero-sum game. One of the reasons that uh, conditions have deteriorated so badly in the United States is that we have this growing illegal population. It is no longer a small fraction of the population. 60% of all Mexicans present in the United States are illegal. 40% uh, of all Latin Americans in the United States are illegal. One third of all foreign born people in the United States are illegal. They have no labor rights. They are fundamentally exploitable at the, at the most basic level. And not surprisingly, wages and working conditions deteriorate under these circumstances. But the counterfactual is not no immigration. The counterfactual is a legal system of immigration. George. Uh, let me actually add one thing about guest workers, because uh, there's a phrase by a very famous German novelist who looked at the German situation years ago and came up with what I think is the wisest statement about guest workers. And that is, he said something along the lines of, we wanted workers and we got people instead. <laughs> and uh, whenever one thinks about guest workers, just remember that it's not like importing a car that you can dismiss and discard in three or four years. There are people in, this, in a democracy like we have, in a social assi assistance system that we have, is very different than importing goods. And that's something that people who support the guest worker program don't tend to realize, that there's, there are costs down the line that are not associated with just workers. Uh, now, about your question about do we need low-skilled workers, the word need is something that economists tend to frown on. I need a yacht, for example, but I can have one. Uh, I go to New York City, and I try to get out of the airport, and, and you know, went into the city from LaGuardia, and my God, every single taxi driver is foreign-born. I would get the impression, if I was the only city I'd ever been to, that unless we had foreign-born people to drive taxis, there'd be no taxis anywhere in the world. Yet, I go to Iowa City, and I get out of the airport, and my God, they're like Americans driving cabs. Somehow, the market adjusted, the market adjusted, the labor market adjusted. Uh, when I first, I used to live in California before I came to Harvard, and in California, of course, every single landscape gardener kind of person is Mexican, most likely legal. And uh, you would think that if you live anywhere outside California, there'd be, the lawns would be dead, there'd be no trees growing, nobody would mow, no children would be born because nobody would take care of the children. And somehow I moved to Lexington, and oh my God, the, lean, the lawns are green. And there are people who actually mow your lawn for you back 15 years ago who were Mexican. <laughs> so again, the market adjusted. Now the point is, that the market adjusts at a particular price. It's not the question that we don't need it. You know, the question is not the way people put it, that illegal immigrants do jobs natives don't want to do. The, statement, the correct statement really is illegal immigrants do jobs that natives don't want to do at the going wage. And that's a very different statement. The fact is there will always be taxi drivers. There will always be landscape lawnmowers. There will always be all the people who actually build a fence, believe it or not, on the border at the right wage. But the problem is employers have a lot to gain by keeping the system the way it is. A lot of people, when they talk about illegal immigration, like to say, I didn't hear it today, but they like to say the phrase something along the lines of, the system is broken. That's just a completely erroneous statement. The system is the way it's been designed to be because the people who benefit from it like it and have a lot of invested power into keeping it that way. There are people who gain tremendously. It is a zero-sum game is not quite the, the correct phrase. There are huge gains to people who benefit from the system. There are very small losses to people who lose. A worker might lose 5%, 3%, something like that. But in the scheme of things, it's just a few workers here and there. Whereas the people who really gain, gain millions and, and millions and millions. And they want to keep the system exactly the way it is. It is not that we have a broken system. It is that we have the system that has been paid for by the people who lobby for immigration. And that's what we're buying. Yes, sir. Yes. Thanks. The uh, conventional wisdom on the left is that the increase in the Ill illegal uh, Hispanic population in the United States is, is somehow due to uh, the inception of NAFTA and combined with the high levels of agricultural 
specifically corn subsidies. Um, um, uh, Dr. Massey, w w would would you agree with that uh, that sub with that that idea? And and if so, uh, do you, do you think that the relative decline in the rate of immigration, illegal immigration, has something to do with the onset of uh, the, the acceptance of ethanol subsidies, which would tend to increase the price of corn in Latin America, thereby re removing the incentive uh, or reducing the incentive to immigrate to the United States? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, uh, <clears throat> illegal migration goes way back before uh, NAFTA. Uh, and uh, NAFTA didn't really result in a, much of an acceleration of out-migration from Mexico. Um, it's, uh, but there's a grain of truth in what you have to say. Uh, NAFTA was negotiated by the United States as a fairly predatory agreement towards Mexico. The Mexican president, uh, Carlos Salinas, desperately wanted in on the North American Free Trade Agreement already concluded by Canada and the United States because he wanted to attract uh, direct foreign investment and wanted to shift from a protected import substitution economy towards an export industrialization economy. And he was willing to trade away a lot of stuff to get uh, into a free trade agreement with the United States. The United States um, um, took advantage of his weak bargaining position and uh, basically negotiated a treaty where the Mexicans were forced to remove all crop subsidies and uh, privatize the, uh, the uh, 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 collective portion of its agricultural sector, uh, while the United States didn't have to touch its agricultural subsidies. Uh, so that uh, uh, the, Mex the only thing the Mexicans could do was put in a long waiting period. So it took a about 10 years, more than 10 years, for the, uh, uh, the free trade to really hit agriculture. When free trade did hit agriculture, there were displacements. Um, but um, these were places that were marginal to the undocumented uh, flows before uh, uh, NAFTA. Uh, so um, what you find is an upsurge in uh, illegal out-migration from the state of Veracruz as the coffee uh, becomes uh, uh, market becomes globalized, and from Chiapas, and from parts of Oaxaca, and parts of the Yucatan Peninsula, you find um, some outgrowth. Uh, some of this uh, migration went to the cities, uh, and which um, um, some cities and uh, industrial uh, plants were uh, actually booming under NAFTA. Uh, some went to the United States, uh, but the net increase was actually quite small in the general scheme of things. The bigger effect it had was to change the geography of migration sending from Mexico and make it much more broad than it had been before. So there are now many more states in Mexico that are involved in sending migration to the United, migrants to the United States than there were pre-NAFTA. Uh, 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 really, it's, it involves a fairly small number of states uh, that are in the south uh, eastern part of Mexico. The border states never sent very many migrants to the United States. It's the least, it's the lowest probability of migration to the United States are states along the border. Uh, the, most of the migrants came from the west central region of Mexico, uh, around, uh, clustered around Guadalajara. Uh, and Mexico City was never a very important component of the migration flow. It's the southern and eastern places that are the most backward part of the Mexican economy that were forced basically into a, a more market-oriented uh, economy that where the displacements occurred, but it's not a causal drive for undocumented migration in the United States. It's at best a, a modest increment into the flows. Peter? Yeah, hi. Um, I'd like to ask um, Mary Waters and Doug Massey to, uh, in effect, respond to George Borjas's uh, challenge at the beginning of his remarks and to be a bit more explicit about what their desired policy goals or end states are in, 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 in what their remarks were all about. Um, it seems to me that George, uh, he can speak for himself, but it, it seems to me that he wasn't merely positing a zero-sum game. He was trying to suggest that our choices are constrained here. And, and I'd like to hear from Mary and Doug what they see as the trade-offs in, in immigration policy. Um, are there any losers? And if so, should we care about them? Um, or, as I think I heard, um, 
you both seem to want to leave your choices kind of implicit. Um, you want to essentially rationalize the status quo, which is a status quo that's essentially set by global market forces. And that seems an interesting position for two people who I think see themselves as liberals to be in. <laughs> I, uh, I guess the guest gets to answer the easy questions first. Um, well, I think you put your finger on it. Um, uh, we're living in a globalized world, and we've invented uh, collectively as nations, and the United States has taken a leading role in doing this, a set of institutions, uh, international accords, multi multilateral institutions, to, prom to promote global trade and investment. And the, econ the global economy has boomed under this regime. Uh, and, but uh, while we have um, put in place lots of uh, policies that facilitate the cross-border movements of goods, of capital, of information, and, and uh, people bearing human capital, uh, we don't want to, ha uh, we want somehow want to keep labor out of the globalization and prevent the globalization of labor factor markets. And that's a fundamental contradiction that policymakers uh, f uh, have found very difficult to resolve. Uh, my own attempt at resolution of this basic contradiction is to note that whereas markets for capital and markets for uh, human capital increasingly are uh, global in scale, uh, and goods, uh, markets for goods and increasingly services and consumer products and so on are global in scale, uh, markets for labor tend to be much more regional. And uh, I think a regional approach uh, to uh, uh, flows of labor, it makes a lot more sense. We don't get migrants from all over the world. Uh, we get uh, talented migrants from all over the world. We get skilled migrants from all over the world. We get labor migrants from a relatively small number of countries that are closely connected to us historically, geographically, and by ties of uh, ongoing economic investment and trade. Uh, and the, the most obvious example is, of course, Mexico, where uh, we're in the middle of a we're, 20, almost 20 years into a free trade agreement with Mexico that has caused the North American economy to, to boom and trade to boom and massive increases in cross-border mobility of all kinds of things. And, and yet um, we don't want to make any provisions for the movement of labor within this economy. Now, uh, I think personally, if the United States uh, and Canada would have treated Mexico in the same way that Northern Europe treated Spain and Portugal when they brought them into the European Union, uh, we, pro we wouldn't have the problems we have today. Spain and Portugal came off of 40 years of fascist dictatorships, horribly inefficient, outmoded economies, heavily state protected, uh, uh, archaic social systems, very poor social supports, a bad education system, lousy capital systems, lousy banking systems, all the, the the usual array of things. Uh, and they, uh, they petitioned, they knocked on the door of Northern Europe, and U Northern Europeans were worried about, oh, God, if we let them in, we're going to have Spaniards all over the place. And Spaniards have been leaving for centuries. Uh, uh, but it was a political project and not simply an economic project. And so they let them in, and they gave them, uh, ultimately, free labor mobility. Uh, and rather than uh, a massive outflow, it prompted a massive return flow of, of Spanish emigres back to Spain and followed by a, a massive in-migration of Germans and Brits and, and uh, Scandinavians uh, into the warmer climes of, 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 of Spain, which is what you get in an integrated economy. Uh, 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 but, and rather than build a wall at the Pyrenees and spend billions and billions of dollars constructing a wall at the Pyrenees to keep uh, the people from the south out, um, they spent billions and billions of dollars in structural adjustment funds to solve a lot of the market failures, to improve the infrastructure, to create a serviceable social welfare system uh, that, uh, in the end, eliminated most of the motivations for migration. So although the wage gap between Spain and Portugal and Northern Europe never closed, it remained constant moving forward, uh, uh, migration stopped. Uh, and, and so I think that you uh, have to uh, move to a more global regime our natural area of interest is the Western Hemisphere. We're not going to be stable and prosperous with a poor, poverty-stricken set of South American, Central American, Mexico countries. Uh, our interest is in creating a stable, uh, uh, 
regime of, of flowing trade and people and growth in, in, in the Americas. And that's what we should focus on in terms of our labor policies, our labor migration policies, and treat our close trading partners in this hemisphere different from those in the rest of the world with respect to labor, not with respect to movement of human capital, not with respect to the movement of, uh, of uh, financial capital, not with respect to the movement of commodities and consumer goods and so on, but yes, with respect to the movement of labor. Um, we, we're going to have to end up here because we have to be out of this room, all of us, by six. So Mary, can you just say something Mary's real fast? Short. Yes. Um, it takes a political scientist to point out that the two sociologists are, are for the market and the uh, economist is um, uh, for the, uh, the, the poor people and, and worried about the, the impact on the unskilled workers. And I just hope that George's, George's concern for that is going to really lead to uh, um, uh, support for increasing the minimum wage, the earned income tax credit, and all the other things that unskilled workers need in America. Because if the immigrants are the are are harming them, then the lack of a minimum wage also causes minimum wage increase unemployment. Oh, uh, that was that was that was a, that was unfair to end it that way. But we have to end it because we 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 have to be out of this room because somebody else is coming in here. So I think our three speakers deserve a big round of applause. Thank you.